This is from the New York Times, although their headline wasn't that big. <laughs> I blew it up for purposes of copying. And I, just to show the headlines, they, and this is very interesting. They were investigating an abandoned vehicle early in the morning. This huge object rose up out of the woods alongside the road, illuminated, illuminated them with a light beam. They ran to their patrol car for cover, radioed it in. They said, keep in sight, we'll send a camera car out. The thing started playing cat and mouse and pulled away and they followed it for 85 miles into Pennsylvania, picking up other police units along the way who were hearing their calls, you know. And so they'd go by an intersection, there'd be another sheriff's car sitting there and they'd go right by, they joined the chase. <laughs> so they had a whole caravan of police uh, cars going into Pennsylvania where it finally hovered, they, some Air Force jets were seen coming in and the thing went whoosh. And as the main witness said, they didn't fool around, they went straight up, whoosh, we're gone. Yeah, rather not they. That was Venus. Yeah, right. It was called Venus <laughs> when they illuminate them. And by the way, uh, I'll show you something. The sketch, this is a sketch done by Deputy Spar, one of the main witnesses of what they saw. And except for that funny looking antenna like thing, it's more or less your classic uh, one bowl inverted on top of another configuration. And it was very bright, so it's hard to, it was probably hard for them to see much detail, but it had, this is the beam that illuminated them, caught them in the beam. And an interesting thing is that when this thing rocked, wobbled, the light beam wobbled with it, you know, so it, it went back and forth a little bit at an angle. And then when it took off, by the way, they'd chase after it, and it would get out of sight, then it would stop and wait for them to catch up. And that's why the cat and mouse chase, which has become a pretty common is that the Portage County case? Yes, about? yes. It was Ravenna, Ohio, Portage County Sheriff's Department. WKSU News talked with Deputy Spar, and here now is his story. The only traffic that uh, we heard was uh, from Summit County Sheriff's Office. It was uh, just uh, relayed by them that this lady had spotted a very bright object. It was uh, fairly large, it was close to the ground, it was too high to be a street light, uh, too low to be an aircraft or a star. Uh, she also stated to us that, uh, or they stated that uh, it was moving from the west to the east uh, towards us, it uh, was coming in our direction. Uh, I accepted the traffic with uh, very little uh, thought about it. Uh, the fireman's ball and all, and uh, maybe somebody tipped a couple. I, I've never read about flying saucers. I've never been interested in them. Uh, we went uh, back to routine patrol. We left the scene of an accident. I uh, started east on 224. Uh, standard uh, thing, nothing going. I had planned to come to the hospital and pick up a casualty report. I saw an object by a, a, a car for the road, a Ford, and believed it to be abandoned. I made a U-turn on 44. I came back in behind the vehicle uh, to check it out, possibly stolen. Someone got a little carbon monoxide uh, for whatever the case might have been. And this is standard that we do check all vehicles that we find. My partner got out the right side. He went to the right front fender, and this is standard procedure. He covers any time there's two men in the car. He observes both the rear window and the driver through the rear window and also the right door. Uh, he's sort of an insurance policy. I walked to the left rear of the car. I made a visual observation of the area around, uh, feeling that uh, it's always practice to check the area, possibly someone was tired, they uh, want some relief, they walked in the edge of the woods to make sure that no one walked out and also as a precautionary measure to make sure there was no one going to come up behind us. Uh, when I looked to the rear of my car, which would be looking west, I uh, at first saw nothing, then I saw this bright object uh, coming, what would appear to be coming up 
from behind the trees, real low and very bright. And at first I, uh, I started to tell my partner what I'd seen and they kept getting bigger and closer. And then I asked him if he would turn and look over his shoulder. Uh, I didn't know if I was having hallucinations or not. Uh, he did a double take on it and uh, the thing kept coming. Uh, there evidently wasn't any way for us to stop it. It stopped directly over top of the two vehicles together. It was completely uh, the ground, uh, the cars, him and I were completely illuminated. There was no difficulty in seeing each other. It was as bright as though there was full sunlight. Uh, I froze for a minute. I, uh, I was actually petrified, I suppose. I uh, hesitated, nothing happened. I you know, didn't start catching on fire. Uh, I had the feeling that I wanted something between whatever this thing was and myself. I uh, went for the cruiser and took Barney at the same time. Uh, I got in and my first uh, thought was, as we wrote a boo-boo now, we, uh, we were, uh, we're in here, if anything happens, we can't do anything. I uh, reached the mic button, I pushed it, it worked. The lights on the car was burning. Uh, nothing seemed to, uh, there was no malfunctions. I, I experienced nothing wrong with me. I looked at Barney and uh, he looked all right. I uh, was waiting for the shock to go away a little bit. I uh, advised the, the station that I had located this object. I waited to see if there was a possibility that uh, the size would uh, decrease on him, that I was over the panic moment. Uh, this time the vehicle moved just to the north of us, still hovering over the road at probably between 50 and 100 feet. It was very large. I'd say it could be between the first observation. A minimum would have been uh, 30 feet. I would guess it would be closer to 50 feet across the base of it probably 18 foot in depth. It, uh, there was nothing uh, weird happening. There was only one slight hum in the area. There was uh, uh, no, uh, no indications that uh, anything was going to burn or anything. There was no sounds or explosions from it or blasting or anything that sounded jet. Then we were back across the road and to the east, about two or 300 feet down the road east of us. Uh, I informed them that uh, we were observing it. Uh, we did not have a camera. Sergeant Schoenfeld advised me that uh, if at all possible to follow the vehicle, to pursue it or keep it under surveillance as long as possible uh, till I could get some cars or some camera equipment or a photographer out there to take a photograph and if at all possible try to identify it make definitely sure that it is an object. If you can identify it by name, make so. The sergeant advised me to do this. We started moving with the vehicle. The vehicle made no attempt to run from us or to escape from us. It uh, gave you a feeling of it was watching you watch it, you know. Uh, uh, the vehicle moved to the east. It started. It uh, never went over about 63 miles an hour at first or 60 or so. We made a right turn, which would be south on 183. We went to 224. We turned east again. At this time, the vehicle was directly behind us, or this object, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, we started east. The vehicle came to us to cross the road again on the south side of 224, maintained an altitude of about time about 200, 250 feet. It proceeded east, right along the rim of the road or the edge of the road, just inside the fence line of the fields. It uh, increased its altitude maybe another 100 feet. The illumination from it did light the ground underneath of it. It increased its speed to about <clears throat> 83 miles an hour on the clock. It uh, maintained the same ground speed uh, for about 10 or 15 miles. After uh, getting into Mahoning County, uh, I could uh, stay parallel with it all the way. It crossed at the Berlin Reservoir to the north side of the road. Right across uh, in front of us, uh, we could stay with it very easily at this time. I increased the speed. 
The vehicle went to 103 miles an hour at ground speed. We ran with it. We kept missing connections at various places that cars couldn't get to us with a camera. We pursued it as we were. It seemed as though that uh, when I had a, quite a tangle of intersections, I was running red light and siren, that um, the vehicle would slow down and wait for us. Uh, then it would uh, increase its speed again to 103, uh, as long as we could run this way. We picked up the East Palestine cruiser as the only cruiser that was able to make connections with us on the route. And he had no camera. He immediately made the same observation that we were making. We watched it maneuver. We watched it gain and lose altitude, uh, go through a different uh, procedures of uh, through its travels. Uh, we got to Rochester, Pennsylvania. Uh, we would have lost it there if there had been any chance of losing it. You have to go through a valley and behind some trees. The vehicle gave up its altitude and started down. It hovered over the highway. When we came back out and up on 51, it was waiting on us. I waited till we got up to it again. I, uh, like I said, nobody's going to believe it, so we got up to it again. We went through freedom and started out of freedom by then. Every time I would have to do a pretty stiff turn, I started sucking air. I guess I was losing all my fuel. The tires, I guess, was pretty hot. And, uh, I seen this one cruiser sitting in a filling station, and uh, the officer sitting in it from Conway. We didn't have any radio contact with him. We were in the station. We informed him what we were watching. He had been watching the same thing. He didn't know that we were behind it, though. He immediately radioed his station. He told them uh, of the observation that we had pursued it from, uh, from Randolph and that it had been traced from Akron. They radioed the airport. We were advised uh, shortly after that we should call in the four of us stood in the filling station. There was some traffic to the effect that some fighters had been scrambled and as though it knew that it might be in danger. It went straight up in a vertical flight. We watched an airliner fly underneath of it uh, directly, a large uh, air transport, uh, probably a Boeing. I would believe it to be a 707. It was a very large craft that went directly underneath this vehicle. Through all the travels and its change, the only distinct projection on the whole thing was what I would say was about 15, 20 feet long. I described it as an antenna. The three of us made the same observation while it was in flight. Uh, it was definitely a, a metallic, uh, I assume it to be a metallic. Uh, it was a vehicle. Uh, it is a made thing or a manufactured thing by someone or someone. It definitely has a means of propulsion. I don't know what it is. It can propel itself. It can maneuver. It has means of navigation. Who controls all this? I, I haven't the faintest idea. I feel that if it's ours, it's a pretty good trick. If it isn't, we got a problem. Could you tell me, sir, what was going through your mind while you were chasing it? Were you then trying to think what it was? My main thing after the initial shock of it was to try to stay with it from the darkening hour of dawn into daylight to try to make some positive identification to disprove swamp gas or uh, a mirage that I didn't know what it was because I'm not an authority on it. I have never I've never seen anything. I just wanted to be sure what I seen was something. I, uh, uh, I had only one thought in mind, and it was if possible to identify it. If it was something I had seen before, I could identify it. I couldn't. I, uh, uh, all I can say is it is a vehicle that I have never seen. I definitely say it's a vehicle, and I'll continue to say it, and nobody will change my mind. If they believe it, okay. If they don't, why, that's, uh, that's okay, too. Did I know you, it's there. Did you believe in UFOs before this incident? No, I, uh, I didn't read about them. I had no interest in them whatsoever. Do you believe in them now? You can bet I do. To your knowledge, uh, today, has the Jets seen them? Have they told you anything about that? They haven't told me anything. They uh, they had no discussion with me. Uh, uh, they uh, anything that uh, has happened before, other than uh, brief things that other people have stated, 
I have never, uh, never heard. I never paid any attention to any of it. I never read about them. I, uh, I just regarded the matter completely, more or less. Um, my time spent when other people were reading about UFOs is if I get any spare time, uh, I kind of like to fish myself. <laughs> Could you tell us to what extent you have been in contact with the federal government's uh, UFO agency? <clears throat> well, the only contact I've had was a government agency right at this time is uh, Wright-Patterson Field. I uh, talked to a major. Uh, he wanted me to identify the object very briefly for them. Uh, I did. He seems to be more interested in obtaining the negative of the photographs that Chief Booker t uh, made that night. He uh, uh, doesn't seem to uh, be interested in what I have to say at all. At first, he wanted to know how long of a glance I had at it or, you know, if it was a blob of light or not. And I told him it was definitely not that I had visual contact and under surveillance for 85 minutes. I, uh, I watched it through the entire flight. I also followed it for 86 miles, which I consider uh, uh, I may have gone further. I was out of gas. I, uh, I uh, know that it was a vehicle, and uh, if uh, they want to discount it or rule it out, this is perfectly OK by me. Can you tell us your average speed during the chase? Average speed during the chase was, I would say, uh, well, I couldn't actually average it out for you. I'd have to go by the log on it. Assuming the miles, I'd say we averaged out pretty close to about 85 miles an hour, considering the time we left and when it was operating at uh, slower speeds. Uh, we tried uh, to maintain a perfect pace with it. My object wasn't to outrun it. Uh, as I told you before, I wasn't interested in uh, getting a hold of it. I didn't, uh, I mean, uh, I was just trying to make an identification. I, I wouldn't know what I was going to do with it if I had got a hold of it, to be honest. Did it ever cross your mind or anyone else's that you were in contact with during the chase to fire at it? Uh, for a brief instant, uh, uh, I thought if it was a weather balloon, and the thought went through my mind, I would. Uh, shoot the balloon down and uh, get the weather device off of it, return it to whatever station that it uh, belonged to. Uh, I, uh, that was before I got a look at it. I made a mental note if I saw a low floating object and it was a balloon and it was about to fall and stand a chance of never recovering the instruments, uh, I would go ahead and shoot it down. And, but uh, I'm not fool enough uh, for any reason if this thing was uh, whatever it was. Uh, if it's capable of doing what it was doing, I don't think anybody in their right mind would be fool enough to attempt to harm it or to do it harm. Uh, at least uh, I wouldn't. Getting back to the photograph that Chief Booker took, uh, you stated before that after you ran out of gas, it went straight up vertically and took off. As you saw it in the distance after it took off, did it look similar to Chief Booker's picture, which was taken from a distance also? Yes, it, uh, I would say that it did. Deputy Spar followed the object for approximately 83 minutes before he lost it. He first observed it at 5.07 Sunday morning. This would mean the object disappeared at approximately 6.30 Sunday morning. At 5 a.m. Sunday morning, Mantaway Village Police Chief Gerald Booker was on patrol in his city. Mantaway monitors the sheriff's radio, and so he heard Summit County informing Portage County of the UFO. Booker told WKSU News that he was highly skeptical of the report and did not expect to see anything. He was wrong. Moments after he heard the report, he observed what he called a bright, shiny object hovering over the city. Not believing what he saw, he went home and got his wife out of bed to see it. They both went out to their front lawn and watched the mysterious object. Booker had an inexpensive camera in his patrol car. With this camera, he took three shots of the objects. One of these shots is now being examined by federal officials in Washington. WKSU News got this description of the object from Chief Booker. I hate to say how it looked, the axe. Uh, let's put it this way. When it moved to the left, it, it looked like it was tilted. And it didn't appear to be round anymore. Looked, uh, I feel like an idiot saying this, but it looked like, oh. like a saucer. <laughs> it looked like two saucers, actually, as if you take two saucers and uh, put the, the rims of them together and uh, the, the bottom of them would be out and you'd be looking at it. How are you finding people's reaction to your story? 
for the bar. Oh, they doubt it. Oh, I've had some kidding, yes. Some of them believe it. Uh, you sort of admit I, that I can't it. blame the ones that, that uh, kid me about it or don't believe it because uh, I don't think I would have unless I actually saw it as I did. According to William Weitzel, an investigator who came to Ravenna from the National Investigative Committee of Aerial Phenomena, the UFO sighting by Deputy Spar and Neff is genuine. In the opinion of his organization, only one-tenth of such sightings are ultimately said to be valid. Weitzel said he can only speak for himself and not for NICAP until officials of his organization study the reports and photographs taken by Dugert. He also stated that he believes Spar's report of the object he tailed is valid. He also feels confident that his organization will decide the same way. And so the question still remains, what was it? Was the object a natural phenomenon such as marsh gas? Was it an experimental device being developed by our own or some other country? Could it have been a weather balloon caught in a fast air current? Or was it a vehicle that came to us from a civilization far advanced from our own? Dr. Alan Heidick of the University of Michigan, a scientist who investigates unidentified flying objects, once said that the vast majority of UFO sightings can be explained quite easily. Most of the remaining incidents have probable causes. Only about 1% of all sightings cannot be explained. But as Dr. Heinick said, the fact remains that if only one out of all the thousands of sightings that have been reported turned out to be a vehicle from beyond our world, it would be a development that would change our concept of the universe radically.